Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us today for our quarterly webinar series, CIO's Corner Quarterly Update with our Chief Investment Officer, Chris Gauthier. I do see a lot of recognizable names on our webinar today. We're really excited that you're here. Uh, for those of you joining us for the first time, my name is Amanda Sylvia. I am the Client Service Associate for Stoneheart. I do want to start us off with just a few housekeeping items. On your GoToMeeting taskbar, you should see a section titled questions. Please feel free to submit your questions uh, right in that box throughout the course of the webinar. I will be monitoring them and will ask Chris to answer as many as he can at the end of the webinar. If we do happen to run low on time and we do not get to your question, Chris or myself will reach out to you after the webinar and we'll make sure that we do get your question answered. I would like to introduce our speaker for today. Chris is Stoneheart's Chief Investment Officer. He brings more than 15 years of investment management experience to our firm. He works with both institutional and individual investors. He's responsible for setting the firm's overall investment policy and strategy, including directing our asset allocation, investment risk, research, and portfolio management fun functions. Chris, thank you so much. Thank you, Amanda. <clears throat> and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, nice to see spring starting to emerge a little bit here in northern New England. And you know, hopefully with the emergence of nicer weather, continued vaccine rollout, we'll start to see some semblance of return to normal in regards to the devastating impact of COVID-19. So at least, and as we're showing the presentation, we're starting to see some good signs on that front. Um, so what we'll talk about today is we're going to talk about asset class performance, really history. It helps to know where you've been, to know where you're going. We'll talk about asset class performance over the past year and in the past quarter. And we'll also take a look at the current investment environment through our multiple lens approach, looking at it through technical, macroeconomic, and fundamental evaluation factors, along with the qualitative aspect, to really try to find the signal through the noise. And we'll kind of close up before questioning with portfolio positioning. Really, given the historical asset class performance, given the current investment environment, finding the signal to the noise, how are we positioning client portfolios for 2021 and beyond? So before we jump in the presentation, I always like to go over our investment philosophy because I think it really helps set the framework for our conversation today and really gives the people listening to this a much better understanding of the conclusions we come to and kind of how we came to them. So the first thing, we believe mean reversion. Trees don't go to grow to the sky. Um, price matters. So really what you pay for something really does drive returns. We do believe exposure to core factors. So they're like valuation, quality, momentum, yield, really do offer long-term excess returns above what you can just get in the passive marketplace. Diversification, still the only free lunch and investment. And finally, risk is really not stationary. It really does fluctuate throughout the market cycle and must be taken into account when positioning client portfolios. So with that, let's take a look at quarterly performance, looking at Q1 2021, of course. You know, and overall performance in the quarter was very good as economic optimism surged as an acceleration of the vaccine rolled out, coupled with the passage of the 1.9 trillion, yes, trillion, I have to get used to saying trillion now, it's just amazing, um, American Rescue Plan, really boasted economic growth forecast for 2021. So the first quarter was very strong for stocks, and we represent stocks in this chart by blue bars for US equity. So anything you see in blue is in the US equity space, and green for international. US small caps led the way by a very wide margin at a little over 18% return, followed by US large cap at a very respectable 6%. So the gap was wide, but still large cap had a nice return at 6% and small caps, tremendous at 18. International, again, represented by the green bars, also performed very well in the quarter, but did trail the US. But the overseas equity markets return somewhere around three to four, depending if you're in, in international developed frontier or emerging markets. Oil, represented in yellow on this chart, really led the way in the quarter, coming in at over 20%, 20%, sorry really which really boosted the broad commodity complex and offset the weakness we saw in precious metals which also represented in yellow on the right hand of the chart as they posted negative returns in q1 we did see bond yields rise sharply in the quarter and that really pressured the fixed income complex represented by the purple bars um, really long-term treasuries had the worst quarter since 1980 coming in at almost a negative 14 percent which is amazing for the treasury market um, there were pockets of positive performance 
in fixed income land as floating rate and high yield, right in the middle here, you know, right after Frontier, did manage some positive returns in the quarter. And that was really due to their less exposure to rising rates. And as we'll see when we take a look at the investment environment further along in the presentation. Looking at the quarter through a factor lens, like we said, we do believe in factors and we have value factor, things that are trading cheaply compared to history, quality, think about strong balance sheets, good management, momentum, things that have performed well in the past, yield, you know, returning cash to shareholders, and we all and we benchmark it to the S&P 500 here. And looking at this quarter for the factor lens really shows the value to growth rotation we saw at the end of 2020 continue into Q1 2021 with value up almost 19% um, in the quarter and momentum representing the growth trade here because that has worked in the past and they're down almost 21, you know, basically flat to negative for the quarter. So we really saw that growth, the value to growth rotation continue. Um, and as we'll see throughout the presentation, you know, really where you take risk in 2021 will be the biggest driver of returns in investment portfolios for 2021. Taking a step back, and taking a little bit bigger picture and taking over the past year, you know, it's what a difference a quarter makes, right? I mean, we rolled off the steep decline in prices we saw in Q1 2020 due to the initial impact of COVID-19. And this is what you get. You know, as we saw in Q1 2021, small caps led the way in equity land by a huge margin again, up almost 100%. I mean, small caps are up 95% year over year, followed by emerging markets again, International equity is represented in green, U.S. equity is represented in blue. And then we saw large cap up almost a little over 50%, followed by developed international equity, but all posted very strong year over year returns. Commodities, again, represented in yellow here, really included precious metals, had a good year, including precious metals, also had very strong year over year performance. Um, Looking at fixed income land, again in purple, was more mixed, like we saw in the quarter, a strong performance in credit. We consider in credit we're looking at high yield bonds, floating rate, corporate bonds over here, offset steep declines in long-term treasuries, down a little over 17%. Again, as we talked about in the first quarter numbers, those long-term treasuries are most exposed to rising rates. And we'll take a little bit deeper dive into that when we look at the fixed income market. The only other significant decliner in the, in the year over year basis is the dollar um, down here represented in yellow at a little over 6%. And this long-term downtrend we've seen is intact and we see that continuing as 2021 rolled, rolls on. Taking a step back, kind of looking at the one year performance, really the message to me was as, as long as you took risk somewhere, anywhere in the past year, it did turn out very well for you. I don't think that continues in 2021 because where you take risk is going to matter much more than the level of risk you have in a portfolio. So moving on to the current environment, I'll start with taking a look at where we stand in the U.S. equity market represented by the S&P 500 compared to history. Just a quick glance at the chart, you can see we've certainly come a long way as we bounced off the COVID-19 lows down here and powered to new all-time highs. Um, in the market, and this is as of 331. So again, I'm looking at the quarterly basis. So it's even higher now, over 4,000. You know, given this, you know, it's, it's helpful to see how the current peak compares to historical peaks, you know, and that's this call out box right here. And we have different PE ratios, dividend yield, comparing it throughout history. And what that tells us is the market's not as overvalued if you use PE as your measurement as a dot com. When dot com we saw PE at 27 or only at 22, and I mean only at 22, but it really is higher than we have seen at more recent peaks, the pre-COVID at 19 and the global financial crisis at 16. So again, pretty expensive from the S&P perspective, but again, you can just see the massive amount of performance we've had, up almost 80% since the bottom of the COVID crisis. So moving on to real-time economic data, and yes, Big Brother is watching you. Um, this is data compiled by JP Morgan, but it's compiled from the big data sources available on the web. Think about the Transportation Security Administration, think about Google Maps, think about Uber, Airbnb, Booking.com, they all sell data in big chunks, not individual personal data, but large chunks of data. And what we can do is take that data to get an idea about what's happening real time in the economy, how many people are moving, what are they doing? And it really helps us put this current expansion in context 
as we see the massive decline in being the data when COVID came due to the economy shutdown and a bounce we have seen as the economy begins to reopen. You can see really April and May when it started coming up here, I had to get my cursor to work there. You see it coming up. And again, we're not all the way back, but again, you can see we're upward sloping to the right, we're headed in the right direction, right? So this really points to further ep economic growth. One thing that would concern us is we start to see any roll off in this data. Again, if we started seeing some downturns or flattening, we don't get back to normal, that would cause us some concern. But we're just not seeing that yet. So overall, looking at the real time economy, you can see an economy that's starting to reopen and looking like it's in expansion mode. Thinking about COVID-19, um, really looking forward to a time when I don't have to show this chart. Um, but on the bright side, we have seen progress, right? We are making, in the role of the vaccine across the globe, UK leads far and away in advance, but US has followed. But even the ones who are lagging, they're still headed in the right direction. They're moving forward. So it's starting to see some positive impacts from this as a world. You know, we're headed in the right direction. And drilling down to US COVID data, really shows us that we are on target with the vaccine rollout as cases have declined significantly as represented by the left-hand chart over here as hospitalizations have too. And we are right on schedule to meet the goal of 50% immunity by May from the right-hand chart. And in fact, right before we jumped on this webinar today, the CDC just released data and they are announcing that over 100 million people in the US are fully vaccinated now. That's full, almost 40% of the adult population. So again, headed in the right direction. And as long as this continues um, and this vaccine rollout continues to roll out, we'll be supportive for economic growth in 2021. So now we'll take a look at economic growth in the US and we'll use the measurement of GDP, which is the broadest measure we have to judge a level of economic activity. On the right-hand side, you can see what makes up GDP, consumer spending which is the majority part of it, government spending, investments, and net exports. I wanna bring your focus to the left-hand chart. Looking at this first bar right here, this is the actual GDP that happened in Q4 2020. We saw that it grew by a very healthy 4.3%. And we look at the bars to the right of that, which are all expectations. We see that the expectations for economic growth are for really for further acceleration 2021 and beyond. Um, in fact, when we look at this Q1 GDP number, you see the black is consensus. Goldman, who we compiled the data for us, is a little bit above consensus. It's consensus is at 5.4. Um, the government actually runs pre-GDP numbers before they actually post it to kind of give you an idea of where it's headed. And it actually came in today at 6.4. So that's not the actual GDP. That's what you, that's what they're estimating GDP will come in at. So again, good data, strong data, and we're seeing confirmation of these estimates. So we agree with this assessment um, that economic data is posed to expand and keep moving forward. And one reason to give us confidence in this is that the forward-looking economic data we monitor is really confirming this thesis. And a couple of data points I'd like to look at is on the left-hand side is the Citigroup Surprise Index. And basically what this does is this looks at the economic data coming in and is it beating or missing expectations. And that's key, right? It's not saying is it good or bad. It's not saying is it positive or negative. It's saying given what the market is expecting, is it coming in better or worse? So again, even if you have high expectations, like we saw in the GDP, you know, expecting good growth, as long as the data is coming in above that, you have confirmation that the growth will continue and the market will be take that as a positive sign. So again, anything above zero on this left-hand chart, shows that the economic data coming in is greater than expected in the marketplace, which is a good sign and pretends to future rise in equity prices. On the right-hand side, we're looking at PMIs for China in blue, Euro in green, US in, in gold, and the global in red. And basically the PMIs are diffusion indices. And they ask a whole bunch of businesses and they try to see to figure out if the economy is in contraction, which means it's registered below 50 on this chart or above 50 in expansion. And you can see fully the entire world is in a global expansion mode. So these expectations give us more confidence in our outlook. It really means that the data is coming in better than expected and companies expect future economic growth. So this really does support this global economic growth um, thesis. So again, very good on the economic data front. Now turning to monetary conditions, and you know, look at the bottom hand, chart, you can see that the Fed's balance sheet is growing about at $100 billion a month, 
which is absolutely ridiculous. Again, providing liquidity for the marketplace, um, providing support for risk assets. Look at the Fed is still anchoring short-term rates at record lows. You can see that up here on the right-hand chart at 0.25, which is the rate they control. And we also see that on the upward sloping yield curve on the left-hand chart, which all taken together, all point really to continued support from very easy monetary conditions provided by a very dovish Fed. So the, dev is, the, the Fed is providing support for risk assets here. So given all the support we're seeing from the Fed, we've actually seen a doubling of the money supply since the beginning of 2000, 2020, which is unprecedented, unprecedented, as can be seen in the top chart right here, remains at record levels. So again, the amount of money that's being put into the system due from the Fed is at historical levels and is almost doubled. Um, since the beginning of 2020, which is amazing. This, is, it, this top shot really shows the amount of cash in the system is a, crazy, it's a wash. But the lower chart shows how much cash is moving around the system. So we know there's a lot of cash in the system, but is it moving? Are people doing economic activity? And we can see that the speed of money has really not picked up to match this level from the bottom hand chart. This does really give us some pause for concern. But taking together the overall weight of the monetary evidence, evidence, the dovish Fed, the high money supply, even with money not moving around as much, it is very supportive for risk assets in 2021. So now the next question is, given all this money sloshing around, you know, are we seeing all this translate into higher inflation as economic theory would suggest? Well, we asked Alan to see it and the impact of this money creation, albeit off a very low base, as the next two charts on inflation will, sh will show. So even as we don't see a rise at the end user in inflation, represented by the CPI and PCE, which is the prices consumers pay for goods, represented by the green, on this side, green and blue, lines the left-hand chart, we are seeing price increases at the beginning of the supply chain as input prices like raw materials are climbing fast, which is represented by the gold line in the same chart up here. So again, think about the beginning of their production cycle, we're really seeing prices rise. We fully expect these price rises we are seeing at the producer level to flow through to the end user as expectations in the market for high consumer prices are also increasing, which is shown at the right-handed chart. So when we look at the two charts, it's saying that in the beginning of the production cycle, we're seeing higher prices, which should translate into higher prices at the end of the production cycle eventually. And then do, does the market believe it? On the right-hand chart, they're saying, yes, we're starting to see this and we expect future prices. So everybody's expecting inflation to come in hotter than expected here. And inflation is definitely picking up, but context is key. And as we see on the next chart, the rise in prices may not be all that bad as we're currently extremely at low levels of inflation. You know, we look at through history going back to 1971, we're almost at record lows, you know, just a little above a few little dips you've had in, after the global financial crisis in 2015. But again, we're at pretty much near record lows here in inflation. So we have a long way to go, but the trend in inflation is definitely heading higher. Now, nothing in this world is free, and there is a cost to all this largesse, which can be seen when we take a look at the government's financial picture, which again is far from pretty. So the first thing to note on this is that this does not include any proposed stimulus or anything that's proposed. This is from the CBO, nonpartisan government organization, which just takes current policy that's enacted, that's in law, and projects it out over the next five, 10 years. And you can see in the bottom right-hand chart, you get a federal net debt. Again, no ends in sight, and almost over 100%. The budget surplus deficit we see here, again, no insight to the deficit. Don't see a surplus anytime soon in the marketplace. And it really has to do, you know, when we come to what the government spends and takes in, which is on the left-hand side here, which I want you to concentrate on now, we need to borrow 50% every year to cover our spending. This is before any new stimulus and any new spending at all. You know, and the markets really have not penalized the government yet, but the bill will come due. And you know, we're really watching borrowing costs. And we can see right here that the net interest, which is representative of the US borrowing costs, is still very small, 4%. And a lot of this was due to the, the very low rate environment the Fed has produced. Just imagine to what these borrowing costs do if rates we actually had to borrow at traditional rates, you know, not at the 
225 basis point at the more three, four, five, you know, even seven or eight percent. And you can see how it would jump up very quickly and start hurting economic growth. You know, we're not seeing this yet. You know, a really what we're looking for is the long end of the yield, the long end of the yield curve. And that's where we're looking for signs of stress. And really looking at that 1.75 on the 10 year, which would give us pause. So again, we're really looking at that as a ceiling, hopefully before interest payments stop biting the government. So that's the economic environment. So turning to equity markets, like we'll see, we'll see, again, like we started off this presentation, where you take risk will be crucial in navigating the choppy waters ahead in 2021. No sugar coating it, no matter which valuation metric you use, the weight of the evidence points to an overvalued market at the aggregate level, as can be seen in this chart. Again, using the S&P 500 as a proxy for the US equity markets. This time we're using multiple different valuation metrics, normal PE, CAPE, which is just at a 10 year trailing, um, price to earnings, dividend yield, price to book, everything we use on traditional valuation metrics. And again, tells the same story. Extremely overvalued. Not as overvalued as we saw in the past in dot com, but anything in recent history, we had definitely extended on the valuation levels. And while the market in total may be expensive, there are pockets of attractive opportunities to be found if you know where to look. We're thinking value stocks. So again, what we're looking at here is placing those same stocks we used at that ag in the, that we used at the, the prior chart, the S&P 500, 500 index stocks, but just bucking them into quintiles. So you can see how the lowest quintile, represented by the dark blue line here, does not appear as expensive and may provide a nice opportunity for outperformance in 2021. Again, this is what considered on blindly considered valuation stocks, trading much cheaper than, than the market multiples we're seeing in the marketplace. And you see the highest valuation quintile, again, the top 20% um, of stocks in the S&P 500 trading at almost 32 times. And this has an outsized impact because these tend to be those growth stocks, right? The Famega, the, the Facebook, the Apple, Amazon, Google, and we've seen before in previous presentations how they are concentrated at the index and they represent more of the index based on weight. So you can see where that skews the aggregate number, but there are pockets of attractiveness. And one thing we do like here is this value over growth. Another way to look at the equity market in terms of op pockets of opportunity is factors. Again, we're big believers in factors. We do think they drive returns. And one thing we like to look at is factor valuations compared to history. Again, what we're looking at the bottom here chart here, chart is are these factors cheap compared to where they've traded in the past 10 years or 35 years, or are they more expensive? Well, you can see that on the cheap side of the ledger, we have valuation, size, think about small cap, again, compared to itself to history, even a little bit of momentum given the poor performance we, we saw, but not as cheap as valuation and size. So again, this really supports the value and growth rotation as when you look growth and back, growth and quality on the right hand side really appear expensive relative to their history. So again, where you take risk in the equity market is going to matter much more than the amount of risk you take in the US equity market. And we really do like the value stocks and small caps. Another pocket of opportunity is overseas. Um, they also they appear very attractive. Um, they tend to outperform in periods of global growth, which we saw in the economic data is expected to continue, and we're seeing strong economic global growth. Uh, and they also have some nice valuation tailwinds we're looking at here. We're looking at, again, at a price to earnings ratio. And again, it's not an absolute level, it's the discount to the US. So again, throughout history, back to 01, you can see that it has traded at a premium to the US once, that's it. Usually trades at a discount, but not at this much of a discount. So right? extremely historic low levels of a discount to the US. And you get a nice little pickup in yield compared to history. So again, combining those two, the weaker dollar story we talked about in the quarter, you might get some nice performance pickup by moving overseas into EM and developed international equity. One other place we really linked might be some opportunities in the equity market is clean energy. And what we're looking at here is, you know, it really does appear attractive on our framework. We look at the left-hand chart, which looks at the global investment into this space. You can see the amount of money moving into this space is tremendous. And the expected growth of the industry, which you know, kind of goes hand in hand with investment on the bottom right. So again, lots of money coming to the space, great growth in solar wind. And you can see the share of capacity additions that almost all new capacity for energy is solar and wind in the US, which is a good sign. 
And we also see in the top right hand chart, cost coming down. So you got cost coming down, money coming in, growth picking up. Um, so again, taking advantage of this carbon transition by having some exposure to stocks participating in this transition may offer a good risk reward trade off. Again, like we talked about throughout this presentation, where you take risk matters more than the amount of risk you're taking in the marketplace. So that kind of sums up the equity land, and we're going to move on to fixed income land, where it's all about the rates and where they are, and more importantly, where they are going. The evidence really does point to a continued rise in rates, given the monetary, fiscal, and growth expectations we expect for 2021. But like in equity land, where you take risk will be key. And as, as always, there's pockets of opportunity to be found. So we're looking at the fixed in income yield curve. The blue line represents where it is at the end of the quarter. The green, green aqua line was where it was the end of February. And the gold line was where it was a year ago. So again, we did see this, you can tell for a quick glance, saw a significant steepening of the yield curve. As a long end of the curve, and we usually consider the long end of the curve 10 years or greater. So again, 10, 30. So anytime you listen to a TV show or reading the paper, they say long end, we're talking about here. This is intermediate. Anything less than three is usually short term. And we saw that the long end of the curve saw its largest increase since the fourth quarter of 2016. Rates at the long end have doubled. So again, even though they're so low, they actually have doubled on a year over year basis. No movement on the short end, which can be seen in the graph here, as the Fed continues to exert its will to keep them as close to zero as possible to provide support for the economic recovery. And they have definitely accomplished that mission. We saw the impact of the rate rise in the beginning of this presentation and the negative returns throughout bond land. Rising rates, all else being equal, will have a negative impact on bond prices. But like we saw with inflation, even with this meteoric rise, we are still at historically low record levels. Although we are seeing real rates, which is this dark brown line here, kind of going up positive, but that's the cost of money. So it is going up, so becoming more cost of borrowing. So we're starting to see signs that the money is becoming more expensive and that the tremendous amount of levels of debt in the world are starting to take a hit. And you end up with this two sides of the same coin, right? With the low rates compared to history. Rates are so low, a large relative increase won't derail the expansion, right? We're already so low, so if the rates double, so what? We're still at record low levels, expansion will continue. Unfortunately, the other side of the coin is rates are so low, that they'll rise quicker than normal and return that quicker to normal and the Fed will lose control. Only time will tell how this will play out. But like we said earlier, we're really looking at this 1.74, which is what it actually closed at the end of the quarter as a key level to judge what it's happening in the marketplace. And as we've seen April roll on, this has come down, I think we're at like 1.65 now, the 10 year treasury last I saw. So again, acting as that key resistance. We're really watching this to make sure this doesn't give way on the upside. And if it does, watch out. Like we saw in equity land, you know, in aggregate, fixed income also appears very expensive. And what we're using here is spread to treasuries as a valuation metric. Kind of think of it as the PE for bond land. And all it is is it's what investors require an extra income. So looking at high yield there, they require an extra almost three and a half percent of income over treasuries to take the risk of investing in high yield. So when they're this low, you can say that they're very expensive. When spreads are wide, they're very cheap, all else being equal. Quick glance, looking at all this, you can see that how expensive the fixed income market looks given how low rates are and how much the risk is not being priced into the marketplace. So again, at the aggregate level, you can see these spreads are very low. You can also see how low income levels are, right? Compared to history, even at US Treasuries, you're not even earning 1%, um, which is ridiculously low compared to history. So, so the impact of a rising rate environment is even more. So even with a rising rate environment and this poor valuation picture, there's still pockets of attractiveness to be found. So what we're looking at here, and I want you to concentrate on the right-hand side, is what we call duration. And what duration is, it's a simple calculation that says all else being held equal, a 1% rise in interest rates would cause this security to fall this much. Also works on the downside, if rates were to fall 1%, the security would rise because rates and prices 
are negatively correlated. And you can see at first glance where all the risk lies in rates rising. Again, 1% rise in rates, all else being equal, you're, lo you're losing 17% in long-term treasuries. And we saw that in the numbers, right? This actually did happen pretty close, 10-year. But then we start looking at other parts of the market, you can see where there may be some pockets of opportunity that things that actually work when rates rise, right? Look at floating rate, actually ends up with a positive return. Not huge, but still a very positive, uh, positive return in a, in a downward market, which is good for fixed income. We also think active management is gonna matter. So being able to move amongst these asset classes quickly um, really matters. Given the setup of the marketplace, we rely on outside managers to really make those calls for a lot, large part of the fixed income portfolio because they have the history of managing duration and duration management is key. Now, given the performance we saw in the fixed income market and the impact of rising rates could have on bond land, you know, we always get this question about why own bonds at all, right? Are they really that unattractive? And I want to put the bond bear market in perspective. So again, we had one of the worst quarters we've seen in past history in the bond market over the past, um, last quarter, which is a 3.4% decline. And what we're looking at here is since 1976, 180 data points, what the Barclays U.S. Aggregate Bond Index has done for performance on a total return basis. And again, that's just a broad measure of the bond market. And you can see that's heavily skewed to the right, as you expect, because it's not as volatile. But look what a bear market in the bond market looks like, right? Only two times has it ever lost more than 6% in a quarter, and only four times, six to three. You know, so it's heavily skewed to the right. So again, when we're looking at this, we tend to think of bear markets in terms of equity, and we're down 30, 40, 50% um, at any given time, 20. We're just not seeing that in the bond market. So again, a bond bear market is definitely different different than equity bear market and bonds can still play a role in portfolios. So even with the limited appeal in fixed income late, given the le rate level and spread compression, we do still think it belongs in the investors portfolio to provide ballast. And like equities, we can still pull out some pockets of attractiveness. Again, concentrate on where you take risk. So that's kind of the current investment environment as we see as it's set up. So now we're going to turn to our internal risk model and really try to help us find the signal through the noise. So we break down the market into technical, valuation, macro, and qualitative to come up with the signals to see how much to measure the risk environment that we see in the marketplace. And as we see, this is the current model right here. This is where it was at the last quarter, quarter before that, and quarter before that. So again, we can see decreased by five um, in the quarter from positive eight at the total level to positive three, um, but still pointing to a positive environment for risk assets at a positive three. Breaking it down to the technical picture, you know, overall technical score was cut in half from six to three, but the details are not as negative as the headline would suggest because all indicators we use for technical are still neutral or above. We have three positives and five neutral. So even though it declined, it didn't decline in a negative way. It was just less positive. It's not going negative yet. Um, breaking down the technical into the structure and the reversion, reversion, the structure of the market weakened in the quarter. As you saw, a slowdown in the outperformance of the riskier parts of the market, which tend to be a good indicator of investor sentiment and risk tolerance. So the wrong parts of the market was trying to outperform a little bit. We're looking at reversion. We saw that fall by one, as we saw a weakening of the rate of change in trend. So what that means is we didn't see a negative trend. We didn't see a trend reverse, just the rate of growth slowed a little bit. And once that rate of growth starts to slow, it's less positive, not negative yet, but less positive. So taking it all in the big picture for the technical, still pointing to a pro-risk tilt as long-term technical support is still in place. And given that the technical support is in place, historically has led to higher prices moving forward in the marketplace. So very positive from a technical standpoint. Next, we look, break the market down to valuation, which came in at a negative four, which was down by two. And really that decline was caused by dividends paid by companies in the S&P 500, really did not keep pace with the price rise we saw in the quarter. Um, still in the valuations, earning estimate revisions are still the only positive influence that we're seeing from valuation. So again, very dire negative valuation picture, which we saw in all the investment environments that the market at the aggregate is overvalued. And that's what our model's indicating here. 
Going to the most positive part of our model, the economic, no change. It's at a score of plus four. It's at its maximum level. Very positive influence on the risk environment from the economy. We are starting to see, you know, really some extreme readings, right? Economic growth can only go so far. Um, but really, given the unprecedented drop in economic activity due to COVID and the extreme readings we saw at the bottom end, this might be just a little bit of a give back. I'm extremely positive from a macroeconomic environment for risk assets. Lastly, looking at the qualitative piece, to us, this is really using our history, our knowledge, you know, our experience to kind of make a judge on the risk environment. Um, and really for us, there's really two competing um, thesis is here that are balancing it out to a neutral rating. On one hand of the side on the positive scale, you have liquidity, right? The Fed still has your back, providing tremendous amount of liquidity. Unfortunately, that tremendous amount of liquidity comes with the tremendous amount of debt that's in the marketplace. So again, combining that tremendous amount of money being flushed, sloshed around, the level of debt that's gonna be a concern at some point, that leads to a qualitative assessment of neutral. Bring that all down, it leads to a positive three in our risk model. So looking at our risk model, the weight of the evidence approach points to a pro risk tilt for, for portfolios with particular attention paid to where we are allocating our risk budget. So now that lead, now we have the information of where we've been, we have the current investment environment, we have our risk model, how are we positioned and how we can take advantage of what this is telling us. As you can see, we definitely want a pro-risk tilt, so we're overweight equities at the aggregate level. But again, where you take risk is more important than the amount of risk you take. And we really underweight the U.S. given the valuation concerns. But like we said, we saw pockets of attractiveness. When we look at the value stocks, they seem to be trading fairly cheaply. Um, small cap, again, pockets of opportunity where we're overweight within an underweight asset class. We talked about the international stocks, um, some headwinds, I mean, sorry, some tailwinds from a lower dollar, um, global growth stories intact and seems to be accelerating, which helps overseas assets. So again, market weight, international developed and emerging markets, we want to be overweight, which we really find attractive given the growth profile we see over there. So again, equities, definitely overweight, but where you take risk matters. Fixed income, like we saw, it's limited appeal, but it does provide ballast for clients and portfolios. And we saw that, you know, really a bond bear is much different from an equity bear and it does provide some nice support in terms of heightened volatility in the equity market. So again, coming out of neutral, but where you take risk matters more. You really wanna be under eight duration, you know, the exposure interest rates and take on more asset classes that have less duration and more credit risk given the economic growth we're seeing in the, in the marketplace and finding some opportunities in that. Given the growth expectations and the low rates, there's no reason to be overweight cash at all. We don't want to be underweight cash, just neutral, you know, just 0% cash is fine. Opportunistic bucket, we're still looking for some opportunities. We're neutral here. That's really not driven by any risk model or macro opportunities. It's really individual opportunities we're finding in the marketplace. And it's no surprise, we saw the valuation levels. We saw the extreme readings. That's getting hotter and hotter to really find those really opportunistic plays in there, which is why we're market weight. But again, given the pro risk tilt, we're fine taking opportunities where we see it in the marketplace. We just haven't been presented with enough opportunities yet to go overweight. So that comes out to a neutral. So that's how we're positioned as of right now um, for client portfolios moving out. And before we get to questions, we're gonna go through the final thoughts, just kind of sum up everything we talked about today, where we stand. Um, thinking about, we saw a positive technical market, you know, like we saw the trend is your friend, valuations, elevated across financial assets and equities and fixed income. But again, pockets of opportunity, if you know where to look. Earnings um, continue to rebound from the lows. You know, it really does help support risk assets. Economic data continues to come in, surprise to the upside. Again, still positive for risk assets, sensing the theme here. Um, massive liquidity being injected marketplace. Don't fight the Fed, positive for risk assets. Then we get to the negative record levels of debt, right? Not really seeing any signs of stress there yet, but again, given the rates so low and what we're seeing in the rate market, there may be some, some surprises down the road. We're just not seeing it yet. Seeing signs of accelerating inflation in the data, all, all that stim stimulus has worked with the economy. 
we saw fixed income still plays a role in diversified portfolios. I mean, like we saw, a bond bear is much different from a stock bear market. COVID definitely improving, but risks do remain. Weight of the evidence, again, like we talked about the model, really points to a positive risk tilt in portfolios, but where you take risk is going to be much more important than the level of risk you take. So thank you for listening today for our presentation. Um, and now I'd like to turn it back over to Amanda for any questions you may have. Hi, Chris. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so just as a reminder, in your GoToMeeting taskbar, um, there is a section titled Questions. You can go ahead and type some in there. But um, a couple people already went ahead and did that. So we do have a few to get started. Uh, the first one here, Chris, is what is your thinking on Bitcoin? Should it be included in a diversified portfolio? <laughs> Um, yeah, Bitcoin. Wow. <laughs> Just an amazing run here. Um, yeah, we get this question a lot. You know, it's something we do a lot of work on here at SEM because it's it, it's basically a new asset class. You know, as of right now, I really don't think it belongs in a diversified portfolio due to the heightened volatility, uncertainty surrounding the regulatory structure. Again, how they're going to regulate this. Is the SEC going to come in and declare it something that it isn't um, now and in the future? You know, to me, there's just too much unknown right now. I mean, that being said, it is an asset class that should be looked at by the right investor as a holding outside of a diversified portfolio. You know, really what we call the aspirational portfolio, which is a potential bucket of money that can be used by you as a speculative investment. You know, with a downside impact, while painful, will not prohibit you from meeting your financial goals. You know, but you really have to have the financial strength, you think about balance sheet, but also importantly, the financial temperament to handle the large everyday swings we are seeing in this underlying price. I mean, even now, look at the beginning of the year. I think it's lost 30% of its value four different times this year already. We're only in just a little bit past the first quarter. Um, the other tough part with Bitcoin, too, is that it's a challenge to gain exposure to the asset class. There's Coinbase, um, there's some private equity funds out there, and also you can go purchase it yourself on, on mine on a wallet. But it's really tough for the everyday investor to get access to this asset class. So. It's very interesting, and there's a potentially a lot of money to be made, but unfortunately also potential to lose a lot in a very short time period, which you've already seen this year. Um, you know, potential for massive sell-off, so big downside, a negative headline about regulation from any government agency. You know, so really to us, it doesn't possess the characteristics of an asset class to be included in diversified portfolios, but more suitable for the more speculative portion of an entire portfolio. Thanks, Chris. I'm uh, moving on to the next question that we have here. Uh, you didn't once mention President Biden's recent tax proposal in the presentation, <laughs> and yeah, um, and this person's wondering what your thoughts are on the impact to the investment portfolios and if their taxes are going to go up. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I don't know your individual tax situation, so I can't tell you if your taxes are going up or not. But I'm I'm pretty confident taxes are going up. Um, but by how much and who bears the burden, which maybe you may not, it's still very open to debate. Um, you know, it, it's funny. I, I did go back and forth when I was putting together this presentation. I actually included a slide, took out a slide. Um, you know, I decided not to in the end because it's just too much unknown right now. And whatever you are hearing now would not be the final legislation, right? So it's just, it's all bargaining chips, you know? And, and I'm not going to get into the debate on the need for higher taxes as, I need to invest in the world as it is and how it's going to be, not how I think it should be. No one listens to me in terms of how I think the world should be. Um, and it seems to me that the current proposal is the start of a long negotiating process where you ask for more than you are willing to live with and work your way down to an acceptable level. You know, really how politics used to be. Um, and you got to really remember, President Biden has been in Washington for a very long time, right? And he's proving he's been a willing compromiser. He doesn't really stick to those, you know, I want 39% taxes and that's it and I'm not budging, he tends to budge and move and go around to get legislation passed. So again, taxes will be going up on both a certain segment of the population, all that segment hasn't been defined and by how much hasn't been defined, and on corporations. But the level is unknown. So the impact is almost impossible to judge. All those things out there that you see about taxes going up this, taxes going up that, this is your impact, you just don't know yet. Um, until the final legislation gets closer to the end date and you have a much clearer picture of what's happening. Um, you know, the market did sell off when this was first proposed, but 
but it bounced right back. So Mr. Market is really not worried yet. And throughout history, tax increases are usually transitory in terms of performance. Again, with a mixed bag of where it is 12 months or 24 months after the tax hike, is the market up or down? There really is no pattern to that. Um, something we're monitoring very closely. And you know we will adjust portfolios as we get closer to the end of negotiations as the weight of the evidence appears. But we are still in the first few innings. Uh, and, I, I, and we really need to see how this plays out before acting. Um, the good news is, I mean, I don't believe this will be retroactive. So if they pass this this year, which is more than likely they'll pass something, I don't think it goes back and says, okay, anything in 2021 is going to be taxed at a new rate. It'll be forward looking. So there'll be some time to kind of adjust portfolios. But it's something we're really monitoring closely and stay tuned as more information becomes available, you'll hear from us. Uh, Chris, why are companies paying less dividends than you would think now? Um, they're not paying less dividends and I'm assuming this is giving those dividend yield chart is that the dividends paid didn't keep up with the price appreciation. So if prices went up by 6%, dividends didn't go up by 6%, didn't go up by 7%. And what we're using as a dividend to monitor historical valuations is looking at where that dividend yield has been throughout history. So historically, on average, S&P yields somewhere a little bit over 2%, you know, two and a quarter, 2%, depending on the time frame. And what we're looking for is when it yields more than that, it tends to be cheap, right? Prices are cheap, income's being given back to, to clients, future returns have been higher. When it's less than 2%, prices tend to be more expensive and future returns tend to be lower. So I don't think it's that they're not paying as many dividends as before, although they're doing a lot of buybacks because that helps feed their stock options, which helps their salary. It's a whole separate conversation. Um, so, you know, it's buying back stock instead of dividends helps them and if they're running the company. But I just think it's an extraordinary pr price rises we're seeing that are making that indicator look more expensive. So not so much not paying as much as dividends as the um, prices are just going up a lot faster. Thanks, Chris. Uh, it looks like we um, just have one more as of now, unless um, more people want to go ahead and um, send in some more using that questions uh, section here. Um, do you own or have you looked at SPACs and <laughs> Um, guessing special purpose acquisition company, if I'm correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For those who don't know, okay. SPAC, yeah, SPAC stands for Special Purpose Acquisition Companies. You had it right on, Amanda. Um, more commonly known as blank check companies, and they're nothing new, and they've been around for a while. They're just getting a lot more press now. Uh, and for those who don't know, in terms of SPACs, you know, basically it's a wrapper. Right, as all investment products are a wrapper, mutual funds are a wrapper, or a hedge funds are a wrapper, or private equity funds are a wrapper, ETF is a wrapper, it's just a wrapper to include investments. And that's all a SPAC is. And it's an investment vehicle that is formed to invest in a private company and take it public. So it lists on a public exchange, tries to raise money from investors, takes that money that investors give them and goes by as a private company. It needs to do this within two years or it has to return the money. And basically the advantage of this is, is that it really takes the hassle out of the IPO process. They don't have to go on road shows, um, anything like that. And they can also make forward looking statements. So if you're in an IPO, you can't say everything's great here because the SEC won't let you. If you're a private company and you're in an agreement with the SPAC to purchase you to bring you public, you can say whatever you want. You can say everything's great, everything's wonderful, kind of helps your price. But again, there's nothing new in this world. <laughs> this has been around for a while. It's just getting a little bit more attention now. And in terms of individual SPACs, I really can't comment due to SEC regulations on any individual security. Um, we have looked at a few, um, but we don't currently own any in our models. Um, in fact, you know, we had a, just had a lengthy discussion about them at our last investment committee meeting. Um, if I, let, me, let me see if I can pull this out. I think I had this chart up. I was looking at it before. Um, a presentation in an IC meeting. Yes. Um, SPAC. So again, so this is from our IC meeting, um, and this you know really helped convey the concerns we have in this space. So again, going back to 2013, like I said, there's nothing new. This has been around, been around before then. You know, 2013, a billion dollars raised, 10 deals, 10, 10, 17. You can see right here, something happened, right? You know, boom, straight up. Um, 
you know, history shows when this much money is poured into an asset class in a very short period of time, like we're seeing here, the majority of the outcomes tend to be negative for investors. You know, trade very carefully. Do your due diligence on the sponsor. So at the end of the day, like we talked about, you're giving the sponsor money to invest in whatever they deem appropriate. Just like a private equity fund, you're giving someone money to go invest. You know, and as always, investing with the right people who are looking out for your interests and not their own is key. And with this much money in this short a time frame, I'm just not sure how many people in this space right now are really looking to make a buck or really looking out for their investors. So again, it's just something that has a little bit of froth in the marketplace and not something we want to play in right now. Chris, thanks so much. I think uh, that wraps up all the questions that we have today. I just wanna thank you all for hopping on here on your Friday uh, to join Chris and myself uh, for this CIO's Corner. We do host it quarterly. You can expect um, to see more information about our next one in July. You can also always register directly on our website, just www.stonehearthcapital.com. I am also working with uh, one of our senior financial advisors, Andrew Nato. Uh, we will be hosting an estate planning and tax uh, webinar. Um, that will be on Tuesday, May 11th at noon. Um, and so we're working on getting information out about that. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in, uh, make sure you look out for that. And we hope you can join us uh, for that webinar as well. Uh, Chris, thank you again so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great weekend. Uh, take care. Bye-bye.